I'd like to send him to visit his brother, the devil. Dirty Yankee butcher. Lee was worth ten of that craven Grant. I'd give the army didn't take it Vicksburg to get him in my gun sight for half a minute. Maybe somebody will. Yeah, ain't nobody in Abilene to get near enough. Well, Grant's staff knows where this town stood and still stands. Maybe we could plant a bomb, blow up the railroad. Maybe you could all go home and quit fighting the war that ended two years ago. Why don't you quit acting the town philosopher, McCune? That bluebelly killed your son. That'll do for now, loudmouth. Come on, Jimmy, get to your room. The poor lad's own father he killed. And you, McCune, want to scatter our victor's roses in his bloody path. Jimmy, go on now, do you hear me? All right, Dad. Now you listen, loudmouth. It's about time we quit living in a world that just isn't anymore. It's about time Who we... says it isn't anymore? General Grant? Pack of Yankees up north? Well, let me find out we don't kill so easy. You know, for someone who never lifted a gun, never even saw a Yankee up close, you sure are full of fight. What are you intimating, McCune? Someone had to supply beef for our boys. I'll leave it up to somebody who did fight. Ain't that so, Johnny? Beef. Sure, we had plenty of beef. We beef because all we had to eat was beans and goobers. McCune, the papers will put to bed, sir. All right, Johnny, thank you. Two cents, exactly what you and your Yankee-loving paper is worth. And I hope somebody takes a scatter gun and blows Grant to as many pieces as this. before the poison of defeat gets flushed from our systems. A couple of years ago, they were fighting and killing. Now they're just talking. A little while yet, maybe they'll stop counting what was lost and start to build. Johnny, you know, for someone your age and experience, you're uncommonly clean of hate and bitterness. Well, I like to think it's coming along, Mr. McCune. But believe me, it took some scrubbing. Good night, sir. Good night, Johnny. Johnny? Jimmy, what's the matter with you creeping around here like a cougar? I could have hurt you. What's going on here? Jimmy, why aren't you upstairs? What in the name of common sense are you doing with Johnny's gun? Well, I was just showing him something. No, you weren't, Johnny. There's no cost to tell a lie. I was stealing it. Why? To kill someone. Him, General U.S. Grant. Son, now don't talk like you're addled. They'd never be looking for somebody my age to do it. And I could get close enough, and I could kill him. For what? For killing my pa. Oh, Jimmy, General Grant never killed your pa. Well, somebody like him did. Some dirty blue belly, and he gave the orders. Jimmy, those orders weren't directed at your pa, not as a person. And General Grant himself was taking orders. It was a mean, unmerciful thing called war. 
But is it one side right and the other one wrong? Not always. It's just that people think different about things. So sometimes they fight. And good men die. Good men like your pa. And the killing's over, Jimmy. Why is it? If you've got a gun, why is it over? How do you answer that? I guess I don't really know. But maybe someone closer to his own age can try. Sit down, Jimmy. Here, hold on the gun, but sit down for a minute. You know, it wasn't too long ago I felt pretty near the way you do. For more than three years, I've been fighting with the Confederacy, watching them that marched and lived with me getting few and fewer, seeing others maimed and blinded. And in a way, I got to be kind of blind myself because I didn't want it to end. Yeah, that's right. I couldn't stand to get beat no matter what it cost. First part of the war is with the 3rd Texas. And then I spent almost a year in a Yankee prison camp at Rock Island. Then I escaped. Last six months, I was with Lee's army in Northern Virginia. On April 9th, 1865, we were at Appomattox. And the man who was a lot wiser than me knew we were beat. Doug, we can't let it happen. It's got to be stopped. Down here, you off your feet. I mean, do you think that you, a little old nubbin of a corporal, is going to tell General Robert E. Lee what to do? <laughs> it's all over, boy. Well, not yet, it's not. Well, it will be. And thank God in a matter of minutes, too. No more. No more fear and death every morning. Pretty soon, old fuzzy face Grant and the staff are right up outside of McLean's house, and, and Lee will sign that piece of paper and give him that tin sword, and we can go home. To what? To boot licking shame and suffering. To life. To my Cora, little Danny. Well, not me. Well, just go on. You stay here and keep playing soldier boy. Don't you fund me, paperback. I fought every day you fought. Well, did you fight as much as Stone Jackson? Or Jeb Stewart? Or Hill? Or Pendle? Or Rhodes? Well, they're all dead. And most of their soldier boys with them. Sure they are. And if we give up what they all die for, why? Well, sometimes you lose. Well, not yet! Yes, yet, now, lost! Now look, Johnny, I ain't no general, but I know something. Two weeks ago, Gordon had 7,500 men. And now he's got less than 2,000 all starved. And Field's got more men absent than present. And the only thing he's left to pick his whole army is 60 bone-beaten men. Now, what do you expect to fight with? As long as I got a gun, I fight. If I didn't, I'd be untrue to the screaming rebs I charged with at Shiloh and Chancellorville. We vowed together that we'd fight until we were all dead if we had to. And then a ghost would go right on fight. Well, that's all you're gonna have to fight with, boys, a phantom army. As far as I'm concerned, Grant can have all the leavings. Grant. 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 That hard fact, blister face. I can just see him strutting up there, General Lee. Trying to make him drop. Humiliating saint. Feeding him over the head with the bones of the Confederates. Well, there ain't nothing you can do about it now. So you just might as well be content to witness history in the making this here Palm Sunday. Witness? I'm gonna make history. And alone. That is, if you don't have the mind to help. What do you got nurturing in that hot Texas head of yours? This morning I was in McLean's house. Right now, General Lee is sitting in the parlor. I'm climbing around back to an attic room right over that parlor. There's a vent there. I got it all laid out. When Grant walks into that room, he's gonna run straight into a head full of lead. Could you fever it? I sure am. If a southerner kills Grant, there'll be no peace. We'll have to go on fight, and you'll see we'll win. Now, wait a minute, I'll hear it. <laughs> Sorry, Doug, old boy. But now you know, I, I gotta keep you from spoiling. Four years is nothing. We'll go on fighting for 40 if we have to. And we will win. You'll see. 
because they won't have Grant. Sharon! Well, you made good time. But then you have right along. How are you? First rate, sir. Been waiting here long? Not too long. Not for this. Lynchburg? Everything's going our way. Good. I wanted you along for this. Thank you, sir. I heard you were feeling poorly. Phil, I've had the meanest headache for near a week now. Pain so fierce it hurt to open my eyes. Hurt worse to close them. No sleep, couldn't eat. But after I got Lee's letter, there was no more pain. It was a long time coming. I don't know how they held out this long. I do. Lee, where is he? Over at the McLean house, just down the road away. Well, then let's go over and see him. General Lee during the Mexican campaign when we were both in the same army. I was just a lieutenant then. I wonder if he'll remember me. After today, he'll remember you. Yes, I suppose. <laughs> His name's Traveler, isn't it? Yes, sir. Been tending him long? About a year now, sir. Looks like a good animal. Where are you from, soldier? Chattanooga, sir. Chattanooga. When did you get creased? Yesterday, sir. Doctor see it? Uh, I reckon they're all up at the front line, sir. Front lines. You take care. Take care of old Trevor there. Yes, sir. And, sir, thank you.
I suppose, General Grant, that the object of our present meeting is fully understood. I asked to see you to ascertain on what terms you would receive the surrender of my army. The terms I propose are those stated in my letter of yesterday. That is, the officers and men surrendered to be pardoned and properly exchanged. And all arms, ammunition and supplies to be delivered up as captured property. Those are about the conditions I had hoped would be proposed. And I hope that this will lead to a general suspension of hostility, sir. And be the means of preventing any further loss of life. May I suggest, General Grant, that you commit to writing the terms you have proposed, so they may be formally acted upon. Very well, I'll write them out. Can I have uh, that book and something to write with, please? What's to be turned over will not include the sidearms of the officers, nor their private horses or baggage. That will have a very happy effect on my men. Unless you have some suggestions in regard to the form of the terms as stated, I'll have a copy made in ink and sign it. One thing, General. In our army, the cavalrymen and artillerists own their own horses. I know this differs from the United States Army. I would like to understand whether these men will be permitted to retain their horses. The terms don't allow this, General. Only the officers are allowed their private property. No. I see the terms do not allow it. That is quite clear. Well, the subject is quite new to me. Of course, I didn't know that any private soldiers own their own animals. I take it that most of the men in your ranks are small farmers. I know they'll need their horses to put in a crop to carry their families through next winter. I'll instruct my officers to allow all men who own a horse or a mule to take the animals home to work their small farms. This will have the best possible effect on my men. It will do much toward conciliating our people. I have about a thousand of your men as prisoners, General Grant. I shall be glad to send them to your lines as soon as possible, for I have no provisions for them. I have indeed Nothing for my own men. Of course, I should like to have our men within our lines as soon as possible. I have telegraphed to Lynchburg, directing several trainloads of rations to be sent by rail. I should be glad to have the present wants of your men supplied from them. I'm sorry, General, but those supplies won't be coming. Phil. General Sheridan here captured the train from Lynchburg last night. I see. Of about how many does your present force consist, sir? I am unable to say, General. My losses in killed and wounded are exceedingly heavy. Many of our companies are without officers. I have no means of ascertaining our present strength. Suppose I send over 25,000 rations. You think that would be a sufficient supply? I think it would be more than sufficient. And it will be...
be a great relief. I assure you. General. Lieutenant General, U.S. Grant. Commanding armies of the United States. General, I have received your letter of this date containing the terms of the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia. They are accepted by me, and I will proceed to designate the proper officers to carry the stipulations into effect. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, years of devotion to military duty has come to this. And this, too, is my duty. General, the war is over. You are all our countrymen again. That very same gun, Johnny? The very same, Jimmy. And that's how General Grant really was? Jimmy, right after the war, we lost a good friend when Mr. Lincoln was killed. Wouldn't do it all to lose another one. Good night, Jimmy. Good night, Jimmy. Thanks, son. And I know his father would want to thank you, too. Sure. Johnny, I knew you were with the 3rd Texas and at Rock Island, but I never knew before that you were at Appomattox. Well, Mr. McCune, here's how I look at it. In a way, everybody who fought for either side was at Appomattox. Johnny Emma was a rebel. He roamed through the West. Did Johnny Emma the rebel? Alone. He got fighting mad, this rebel lad. He packed no star as he wandered far where the only law was a hook and a draw. The away, rebel, away, Johnny away, Yuma, the rebel. he searched the land, this restless lad. He was
pants are quick and leather tough If he figured that he'd been pushed enough to rebel John This has been a Mark Goodson, Bill Todman production